I'm excited to share with you guys this morning the first message in this new building and as an introduction into what I believe God wants to speak to us this morning as a church, what God wants to speak to you this morning, to give an introduction of where we're going. I want to uh, give us a little bit of an introduction as we start this new season of our church. So we're going to give a little bit of history. For those of you who are new this morning or haven't been around, you're going to learn a little bit of the backstory of who we are as a church, what God has been doing in us since we began and what God's been speaking to us. For those of you who uh, are not new, who have been around uh, maybe since the early days in my living room or somewhere in between there, some of this might be repeat, but I still want to encourage you to pay attention because for us as a family, it's important uh, as we have this kind of, we, we kind of cross the starting line this morning of this new season to understand where we've come from and what God has said to fully understand what it is that he wants to do and what he still wants to say in front of us. So are we all in this morning? Yeah. I grew up here in Indianapolis, like four minutes from here, about 75th and Allisonville is where I grew up, uh, born and raised here in the Castleton, Indianapolis area. After graduating high school, I went and spent eight years down in Texas at Baylor University, sick of bears, had eight wonderful years in Texas. I love that place. Texas really is amazing. The Texans, they're, they're right. It's fantastic. So after eight years of their, uh, eight years in Texas, uh, got married, had one child, we were pregnant with another, Heather and I, and Rose, and Smithy in the belly, we moved back here in May of 2016 to start this church. And when we moved, there was about 20 adults and 20 kids at that point who had connected with us and had basically said, hey, we want to be in for what God's doing with Antioch, and we're, we're like, we're a part of this church. And, and that caught me a little off guard. I didn't think that by the time we moved, we'd already have a little church. And I thought we were going to have to do some other things first. Uh, so we're moving and uh, just realizing, okay, God, well, we're, we're moving next week. And there's already a little church there. So that's a little unexpected. What do we do now? So it's a good place to start. I actually texted a friend last night. Um, and I said, hey, man, I'm heading to bed. We've got our first service in our new building tomorrow. I just realized I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> And that's how I felt that, that first week, too, moving into our house. God, here we are. Do something. So, Lord, what do you want to do? We're just asking God, Lord, this is your church. How do you want to build it? And uh, we had our first Sunday service in our house, in my house of Broad Ripple, the week after we moved. Uh, the adults are in the living room. Antioch kids down in the basement. The Russians made this really cool flag for the kids. They carried down the stairs. They'd be in the basement on the back patio. We had a good time. And we were really excited to be there that morning. And I remember all of us looking around the room and seeing amazing people. Some of, some of them, we, you know, people, some of us, we had known each other for a long time. Some of us, we had pretty much just met that morning, basically. But we were all excited. And as we were getting started that morning, I realized we were all excited, but there was a lot of questions that we had. Because by the time people had said, we want to jump into this church, like we hadn't even really talked that much about what this was. And I remember kind of thinking, like, what are you saying you want to be a part of? Like, we haven't even talked about this very much. So there's these questions in the room in our hearts. We're excited, but this main question is, like, who are we? Who are we? We're, we're excited, but, but who are we? And so we asked God, what do we do this summer? And we felt like he said, take, take strangers and create family. So that you invite people home and not just to an event. We said, okay, that sounds like a good instruction from God. So we're going to create family, but, but the question is, who, who are we? So we spent every Sunday morning that summer in that living room engaging the question, who, who are we? Talking about what are the core values who, of who we want to be as a people. That was in May of 2016. And September 11th, on September 11th of 2016, we had our first public service at, in the basement of Old National. And I can't help but laugh this morning. If you were there, man. Basically, for like a little over a year, we were doing church in the dungeon of a Masonic temple with pentagrams on the walls. It smelled like weed and vodka. The floors were sticky. You couldn't see anything, but we did church. <laughs> Suffice to say, this here is an upgrade. Can I get an amen from any old national folks? Praise God. As we were getting ready to move into Old National, we kind of found ourselves again at a new beginning, similar to that time as we were starting our church, or starting our house. Lord, this is kind of a new season for us. We're going to start inviting people, and so I remember getting together with some of our leadership team, and we were just having conversations. What, who do we want to be? What do we want to be about? What do we want our services to be like? All this kind of thing, and as we're talking, as we're praying, there's this phrase that I really believe God kept putting in my mind that just, it was like the only thing I could say when we would talk about, like, what are we going for here? And it was this phrase, this changes everything. 
And I remembered when I had started following Jesus in college, I, I quickly began to realize that like, if, if all of this is true, if Jesus really is who he said he is, and if that makes me who he says I am, and if he does what he says he does, if I can do, if this is for real, this doesn't just change what I do on Sunday mornings. This doesn't just alter some behavior that I have and I should do not so bad things, right? Like this changes everything. So that was our kind of our banner as we kicked off at Old National. This is what we want to be as a people. We want to believe that this changes everything. This truth about Jesus and who he is. And over the last 23 months, 23 months and seven days that it's been since that first service, uh, I've seen God make that so much more than a statement of faith for this group of people. He has made this a reality for our lives. And we know that Jesus changes everything. Through ups and downs, highs and lows, wins and seeming defeats, we just know Jesus is for real. And he changes everything. And I'm so thankful for how God has cemented that into our hearts and into our souls. Does anybody believe this changes everything? This morning, we find ourselves again in a new beginning, a new season as a church. And I really hope that you like this room, this building. I really do. I think it's like really awesome. And I'm, I'm excited to keep working on it. I think it's super cool, but we're going to continue doing stuff. We're going to continue using it, building things, putting decorations up. Who knows what Lindsay's going to do and what some other people are going to do. And just people are going to make it awesome as we go. It's just going get, to keep getting cooler. But as excited as we are about it, as, as thankful as I am for this building, I know that this building is so much more than a building. It's sort of funny because as we look back over these seasons of where we've met and what that's meant for our church, every little season so far has been marked by a little three-word phrase. Who are we? This changes everything. And, and this morning, I want to share with you three words that I believe God wants to shout to you and shout to our city and shout to the nations of the earth as we enter into this building this morning. I want to share with you three words that God wants to shout to every car that drives by this building. Three words I believe God wants every heart to hear as they drive into the parking lot of this building. Three words that I believe God wants you to hear echoing around the walls of this building. I want you to put it to the top of your notes this morning. The title for this message as we get started here, Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. I had you turn to Isaiah 55. And you may not be big on Bible trivia, but are there any wild guesses about the chapter that comes before Isaiah chapter 55? Anybody? 54. Winner, winner. Front row. Wifey. With the trivia. Isaiah 54. Before I get to Isaiah chapter 55 this morning, I want to talk to you briefly about Isaiah chapter 54. If you're lucky like me, 54 is on one side and 55 is on the other, so you can see them both at the same time. Anybody else? Anybody else living a blessed life this morning? <laughs> it's just too easy. If you've been a part of Antioch for a while, then you know that Isaiah 54 is also a big chapter for us uh, as a church. It's a big chapter for us that holds an encouragement from God, and, and this encouragement in Isaiah chapter 54 is actually why this building exists. These verses in Isaiah chapter 54 are the reason why we built this building. It starts like this, verses 1 through 3 in Isaiah chapter 54. It says this, Sing, O barren one who did not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not been in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of her who is married, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent. Let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes. For you will spread abroad to the right and to the left. Your offspring will possess the nations and will people the desolate cities. In Isaiah chapter 54, God is speaking to his people, the nation of Israel. And he's speaking to them through a prophet named Isaiah. And he is referring to them as a barren woman. He's referring to them as a woman not only who has no kids, but a woman who cannot have kids. And in her pain and in her discouragement, God speaks to her and he gives her this command, build a house. Build a house. You're going to have children. You're going to have lots of children. Your children are going to fill your house. And not only are they going to fill your house, I'm going to use all these children to bless the nations of the earth. I'm going to use them to bring restoration to the nations. 
build a house. Three months after we started services at Old National, we were again praying as a leadership team and really all agreed and felt like God was leading us to start to find a more permanent location for us as a church to find a place that we could call home. And for those of you who have been a part of the journey over the last 19 months since then, we don't have time to go into it, but it's been crazy. It's been really crazy. And one of the reasons from the get-go that it was crazy was because we had plenty of room at Old National. We had plenty of room to grow at Old National. The room we were meeting in could seat about 500 people, and we were averaging about 50. <laughs> and there was no signs, really, of that number growing anytime soon. Like, it was up at 50 because there was a few weeks that were like 80, but mostly it was less than 50. <laughs> God was telling us at that moment to build a house. And like a woman with no children, we had no one to fill this house that he was telling us to build. And like this barren woman, we had no signs that there was going to be anybody to, build this, to fill this house once we built it. There was no signs of any situation changing. But when you read Isaiah chapter 54, when you believe that this really is the word of God, you read this, and we, we read the first three verses, but if you read the rest of it, it's just a chapter power-packed with promise, so full of promise. And, and I want you to know this morning that because Jesus is alive, you are a people of promise. You're a people of promise. Our God is a God of promise. He's the God of hope, amen? Amen. He doesn't leave you out on your own. He's faithful to his word. He's your hope. He's your protection. He's your vindication. He's your provider. You may be at the end of your rope, but God's just getting started with you this morning. You are a person of promise. I need somebody to say, I got a promise. I got a promise. You need to know that you're a person of promise. And all of this is amazing, being a person of promise. All the verses in Isaiah chapter 54, you think one through three are good. It ends at 17. It says, no weapon formed against you will prosper. I mean, come on, those will preach. They'll get you high, you know? Come on. It just makes you want to rise up and, and, and build a building. It makes you want to build a building, and, 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 and that's exciting. It makes you want to believe that God's going to do something with your life. And if our, but if our excitement stops at a building, if our excitement stops in, verse, in Isaiah 54, you get the promise, but you miss the point of the promise. You can't stop in Isaiah 54. You sure need to start there, but don't miss the point of your promise. And if our excitement this morning stops at having a building, if our faith this morning stops at having a building, if our expectation stops at having a building, then we've missed the point of the building. Because God doesn't build just to build. What God builds, he intends to fill. And what God builds with his promise, he intends to fill with his purpose. See, when God gives you a promise, when God steps into your life, when you're the barren woman, when you're wondering where to go, what to do, what God's up to in your life, what's he going to do with you, what's happening right now, and he steps in and he gives you a promise, you got to understand that the promise is just the blueprints. When God gives you, when the, the promise God gives you is just the blueprints. If you want the purpose God has for you, you have to go through the process of God building you. The purpose God gives you, or the, the promise God gives you is just the blueprints. But if you want to step into the purpose God has for you, you have to step into the process of God building you. And when you're in the process of God building you, it can be hard. The promise is exciting. The process is hard. It's hard because building is hard. Building is hard. Choosing to make difficult decisions is difficult. Choosing to make difficult sacrifices is difficult. Choosing to believe for crazy things is crazy. And, and when you're wondering, why am I sticking with this, right? Like God gave you a promise, but now it's now looking like it's happening. And you have these questions in the middle of the process. Why am I sticking with this? Why am I taking this risk? Why am I still choosing faith? Why am I still choosing integrity? Why am I still choosing purity right now? I'm in the middle of the process. 
If you've ever been there, I don't know if this is for everybody in the room this morning, but I know that it's for somebody. Wherever you're at right now, it might not make sense. You might look crazy, and heck, you might even be a little crazy. But if you're barren, and God tells you you're going to have children, build the house. Build the house. You build an empty house on his promise, and you let God fill it with his purpose. Is for you. So what's our purpose? What's our purpose here this morning? Just like the barren woman, God hasn't had us build a building just to have a building. He had us build a building to fill a building. See, Isaiah 54 gives us our promise, but Isaiah 55 gives us our purpose. Come. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear. Come to Jesus here that your soul may live. God steps into a barren woman's life, says build a house, and he encourages her. He gives her promise. He gives her faith. Doesn't give her kids yet, but he gives her this promise to build this house. In Isaiah 55, he, comes, in Isaiah 55, he says, now I'm going to fill it with your children. Stand in the door. Fling it wide open. Open up your arms and say to everybody, come. Come, all who are thirsty. Come to the water. When you give your life to Jesus, you become a person of promise. It's not just hype. It's not just me making you say, I got a promise earlier. <laughs> this is the truth of Jesus this morning. When you give your life to him, you become a person of promise. But I want you to know that your promise has a purpose. Your promise has a purpose. We like to say around here that salvation isn't a destination, it's an invitation. When you step into the promise of the love of God, when you step into the forgiveness and the freedom, when you step in and be filled with the Holy Spirit, it's just the beginning. It is the fulfillment of the promise, but it's the start of your purpose. We can't be a people of just promise. We've got to understand our promise has a purpose. What God's doing in our life, it has a purpose. What God's calling you to, it has a purpose. The decisions that you're making for God, they have a purpose, even in the process. I don't know about you, but when I get really locked in on something, I uh, am notorious for inadvertently ignoring like my hunger and my thirst. Uh, when we were in, in Waco, Texas, after we had gotten married, uh, I was in the discipleship school at Antioch Waco there, and uh, we, we had one part-time job between us. I was doing door-to-door -door sales for window cleaning, which was not very lucrative. Uh, shocker, right? Nobody does that for the money. Who knew? <laughs> so I just graduated from Baylor with a business degree, and the first thing we're doing is knocking on doors. Can I clean your windows? Okay. Like, not encouraging, you know? Like, I had some guys uh, come into my door a couple weeks ago, and they were selling security systems. And I thought, you know, at least people have, like, an inherent value for that. <laughs> you know? <laughs> that's, that's a step up on what I got. But anyways, we, uh, we, we were trying to just make a little bit of money on the side, and so uh, I, I kind of started to try to do some woodworking. And I used to think I could do it until I saw what Daniel Toner made. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, I can't do that. <laughs> like, I, I've made some things. I'm like, that's cool. And then I look at what somebody else actually made, and I'm like, oh, no, that's cool. <laughs> what I built, that's firewood, actually, <laughs> is exactly what that is. So, man, embarrassing. So I told people I could do it, you know, and I built some people some things, and they would get it, like, oh, great. Like, <laughs> like, I paid you for this, you know? So I, I started doing just some woodworking in this little garage that we had, and uh, I, I remember especially when I was doing projects like that, for whatever reason, I think because I was so bad at it, I had to focus so hard that, like, I just would forget that, like, life was happening and that human beings need food and water to function. 
And I'd be like out breathing in sawdust and everything because I didn't know anything about how to be safe doing any of this stuff. And Heather would like bring out, a, she'd like call me, it's lunchtime. I'm like, I'm fine. You know, I'm like in the middle of something. And she'd do you need some water? I'm like, no, I'm fine. I'm working on something. And then, you know, it'd be like middle of the afternoon, Waco, Texas, 100 degrees, in a tin garage. And I'm like, ah, oh, I'm thirsty. I'm like, really thirsty. I've been thirsty the whole time, right? I've been thirsty all day. Like every time Heather said, you're hungry. I was hungry, <laughs> but I was just distracted and I didn't, I didn't know it. I've been thirsty the whole time. It had been true all day, but I had just been too distracted to ever notice. And I think that we're living in a distracted world. I think that we're living distracted lives. If we're honest, it's easy to get distracted. I'd say for me, that's the most the thing that I get most consistently frustrated about myself with, just getting distracted. You guys ever heard of like this thing called YouTube? <laughs> so awesome and terrible. You ever looked up and been like, wait, what time is it? <laughs> Confession time. <laughs> but am I right? It's pretty easy to get distracted. And I think that I think that we're living in a world, and I think we all are born, we're born hungry. We're born thirsty, but it's easy to get distracted and go after things that don't satisfy. We get distracted and, 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 and we live our lives. And I think, I think if, I'm, if I'm honest, I look around and, and I look at our world. I look, I look at our city. I look at social media. I look at mainstream media. I look at blog posts. Or if, if you just hear people's stories, if, if you hear people's questions about what's going on in the world, what, what are we looking to? We're, we're searching for something. We're looking to a person. For something, we're looking to a thing to fill us. We're looking for something to satisfy our thirst, satisfy our hunger. We're looking for an Instagram account to satisfy my hunger. We're looking for a guy in a white house to satisfy our thirst. We're distracted, but we're hungry, we're thirsty, and we're also distracted. And if I look even in my own life, if I look at, at my own wondering throughout my life, if I look at my own wandering, my own searching throughout my life, it's so obvious, but I can be so distracted, too distracted to notice that I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty, and we're thirsty. I was distracted, and I didn't know I was thirsty in fifth grade when my friends were talking about pornography for the first time. I didn't know it, but I was thirsty. I didn't know it when I, was, when I just got into college. And I was too distracted to know what it was, but, but, I, but I was like so nervous. I didn't know like, if anybody would like me. I didn't know if I would like me, if I could make friends, if I would fit in here. And I'm sitting there crying, almost throwing up on the floor between, before going to hang out with my friends because I didn't know it, but I was, I was thirsty. And I remember waking up one morning. I remember waking up one morning. Everything on the exterior of my life was, was fine. It was going pretty well. I was, I was set up for success. And honestly, looking around at a lot of the people around my life, like comparatively speaking, like I was doing great. <laughs> like there's a lot more people who were in much bigger messes, right? I'm fine. I'm good. But I wasn't good. I remember waking up one morning and just realizing something's not right. Something's not right. And, and, and it was that thing in my heart that my mouth used to do in the garage in Waco. I'm thirsty. Woke up one morning and realized I'm thirsty. You know, I had every opportunity, every day of my life to come to Jesus. Every day, every opportunity between my family, the school I grew up in, the environment I grew up in, I had every opportunity to come to Jesus, to come to Jesus to be free, come to Jesus to be forgiven. Come to Jesus to, to serve him, to know him, to love him, to be loved by him, to obey him, to be used by him, to reach out to other people, to see his kingdom come in my life. I had every opportunity, but I just have been choosing to keep my head down, distracted, busy, doing me. Too distracted to know I was thirsty. But that morning when I finally realized the thirst that had been there the whole time, I, I turned to Jesus. 
I came to Jesus, and I, and I was met with a truth that changed my life out of Isaiah 55, verse 1, when, when the Bible says right here, when God, through his word, puts it on a page for you to see this morning, when, it, when I see these verses and see it right here, don't know how this book had landed up on this podium on this day, but it's the word of God, and when he says, come, everyone who thirsty means come, Andrew, you're thirsty. Come to the water. Are you thirsty? Are you thirsty this morning? See, it can be easy. I did this for a long time, so I know how easy it is. It can be easy to come to church and hear a message and think that it's for somebody else. And yes, this message this morning, this verse this morning, it's true for everyone. But if it's true for everyone, then it has to be true for you. On Friday night, just a couple of nights ago, I came in here to this room. We were kind of just finished. We had just sort of finished everything up, and I was working on this message and praying, God, what do we, what do we do? Kind of again in that other moment. Oh goodness, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> Lord, what are you saying? What are you doing? Who are you calling us to be? What do you want to say to us this morning? What do you want to say to us when we get together? I remember standing up here. No people in here, no music, it's just quiet. Got my Bible in my hands and just, God, what are you saying? And uh, I, I'm standing up here on the stage and I'm, I'm trying to get somewhere. I feel stuck. You ever been stuck? Writer, writers, any writers in the room, you ever felt stuck? Any creatives? You're like, I can't, you know, business, but you've been stuck, right? I'm stuck. So I'm like, okay, what's going to help me get past it? I'm start. I'm praying. And I close my eyes harder. <laughs> Use bigger words, right? I start trying to picture who's going to be in the seats this morning. God, who are you bringing? Who are you, who are you going to speak to this morning? And once I finally kind of slowed my life down a little bit, my heart slowed my mind down a little bit, standing up on this stage, I felt like I, I kind of finally realized that I felt like the Lord, he was actually talking to me, and he was leading me to get off the stage and come to the altar, just me and him. And so I'm standing up here by myself, and I start to think, oh, okay, Jesus. He says, just come, just Andrew, I just want you to come to the altar. So I got down and I knelt here and the Lord began to show me something that I realized I seem to need a reminder of really, really often. And that is that, yes, God, you know, he, he wants me to stand up on this stage and preach. He wants us to fill this building and share the gospel with people. He wants us to do church, for sure. He, he, he wants us to go hard. He wants us to know him. He wants us to, to serve hard, to love hard. He wants us to use this building to see his kingdom come. And, and yes, this morning he's doing so much. And, 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 and so much more is, is about to happen. You know, we're seeing it now, but we could never even understand what's about to come. It's all, it's all true because it's just the beginning. But He's, he's inviting everyone to come, and it's happening, and it's coming, and we're seeing it, and we're going to see it, and in the middle of all of that, I can never lose sight of the fact that if he's inviting everyone to come to Jesus, then he's also inviting me to come to Jesus. Jesus is inviting, inviting everyone to come to him, and he's inviting you to come to him. Bring your thirst, bring your hunger. Stop spending your life on things that don't satisfy and come to Jesus that your soul might live. I want to invite you to stand up this morning as we close this time together. We're going to worship just a little bit more. And as we close this morning, I don't think that there could be a more appropriate way to end our first time together in this new building than by responding to the invitation that Jesus is giving to us this morning. Come to Jesus. And I don't think there's any better way we could respond by coming to Jesus, by giving him our lives, and by committing to this message, committing to this banner over this building. God, I want to come to Jesus. I, I, if this is true for everyone, I don't want to miss it. I, I, I realize that's for me too. And in coming to Jesus, you also get to commit 
to inviting others to come to Jesus. Because see, we're all the barren woman. This is our life in sin. This is our life far from God. No fruit coming from it. No life coming from it. That's what I realized that morning. I remember literally having the thought, I'm sucking life from everything I'm a part of. It just was, it just was reality. It wasn't condom. It just was true. And we're, we're, we're all the barren woman fighting so hard to fill the gap in our heart that can't be filled but by the one thing we don't have. And we're spending our lives, spending our energy, spending our focus on things that just can't satisfy. And it's not that they're all bad. They're just not what they're meant for. And this morning, Jesus has an invitation to you. He wants to give you a promise. He wants to say, come to me. I want to build a house, and I want to fill it. I'm going to fill everything you can't fill by yourself. And I want, I'm actually going to fill it so much that you're going to need a bigger house. What I'm going to do through you, expand what you think I can do through you. Expand what you think is possible. Let your, let your life be stretched out. Let your faith be stretched out. Let your understanding of who Jesus is be stretched out. Let your belief about who God made you to be be stretched out. Let me build you so that you can extend the invitation to those who are thirsty around you. You can come. You can come you can come to Jesus. And so this is the invitation this morning. This might be common for some of you. It might be a little extreme for some of you. I don't know. But it's just about Jesus. Whether you've been following Jesus for decades, whether you've been slipping up recently, whether you are in a spot where you're realizing, I've never come to Jesus. I need to give my life to Jesus for the first time today. The invitation is the same for all of us. It's just come. Just come, just come to Jesus. And if you're here this morning and if you're like me, if you don't want to spend your life on things that don't satisfy, if you don't want to run around with a hunger and a thirst that can't be satisfied anymore, if you want to live in the purpose of the promise of your salvation, then I want to invite you this morning to come to Jesus. And just like I did on Friday night, I just want to invite you to come now to the front of the room if you're just saying, God, I just want to come to Jesus. So good. Jesus, we love you. And we thank you for an invitation this morning to come. The door is always open. So God, we bring you our lives and we come to you and we ask, Lord, we're here. Fill us, satisfy us, use us this morning in the mighty name of Jesus.